Okay, friends, Romans, educators, love me your ears. Um, welcome back to uh, everyone. I hope you enjoyed lunch. Thanks again to Lisa Halverson for presenting some of the research that we're doing here. That research really is an ongoing project, and we're excited to continue to work on it. Thank you to her. Uh, I just wanted to kind of give you a run through for the rest of the conference. Uh, Dr. Jeff Noakes will be our next speaker, and I'll introduce him in a second. He will then be followed by Glory Smith and Erica Munson, uh, who will then close, uh, all then close with a, a brief discussion, a wrap up at the end. Um, we will then, uh, uh, well, I'll go to that point. So first of all, our first speaker is Jeff Noakes, and he'll be speaking on teaching relationship building through American history. If you've attended our events in the past, you know Dr. Noakes. He is a repeat offender here, and we're so glad he is. He is a, uh, he's an assistant professor in the history department at Brigham Young University. He has a PhD in teaching and learning from the University of Utah, with an emphasis on liter literacy in secondary social studies classrooms. A former middle school and high school teacher, his research focuses on history teaching and learning. He's the author of Building Students' Historical Literacies, Learning to Read and Reason with Historical uh, Evidence, and has published several journal articles and book chapters on the topic of historical literacy, uh, literacy instruction, and teacher preparation. Uh, so we're going to go ahead. Please welcome Jeff Noakes, and we'll be followed by Erica and Glory. Thank you. I think I'll start by answering the question that I'm asked most often. How do you get your PowerPoint presentation to do presentations like this? <laughs> so there's just a default setting on PowerPoint. You can set them and, and I, don't, I don't even remember how I did it, but anyway, it's check if you use PowerPoint, you can set it up with a default setting to do the closed captioning, and it's really accurate. And I think it's useful for students who are English language learners or Trying to uh, struggle to hear and get along and, and uh, comprehend everything. So, uh, let me see. Because I'm hearing impaired, I've created a Google Doc that shows people how to do it in Google Slides and how to do it in PowerPoint. So, bug me if you want it. I love it when this is the default and Jeff helped me realize it could be a speaker's default because he uses it all the time. All right. So, if you don't learn anything else today, <laughs> at least you walk away with something. Just drop the mic, Joe. Yeah. Drop the mic and walk away. All right. I like how things have already started. If you have questions or comments that were a small enough group that feel free to let's make this as interactive as we can. Uh, I've been told I have until about 2.40. And so it's almost an hour and a half. And so I, we've got lots of time to talk through ideas as we're, as we're going along. Um, my objectives for this presentation, when you're through, you should have materials to do a lesson on Adams and Jefferson. Those are in your, your folder. So you've got those materials. Now, just so you know, this is the first time that I have made these materials available to anyone. And so, if you, as a teacher, I'm sure you realize this is what happens the first time you teach a lesson, you notice typos, and so, so I proofread carefully, thought I had everything ready, pulled out the document packet this morning, and I made it all the way to the first word of the first document before I had my first typo. <laughs> it should be it instead of I. So... I think Carrie is going to make available all of these documents on uh, digitally, which is better for you because then you can adjust the documents to meet the needs of your students and format them the way that you want. And so you can correct those typos. And I'll send her a corrected version before she posts those and makes those available. But you'll find other typos too, so you can correct those as you go. All right, so I want you to have materials for this one lesson, but I also want you to think about teaching through inquiry in a way that builds students' knowledge, skills, and dispositions. 
And so the lesson that we'll be using models uh, the type of lesson that I think that you can teach that nurtures students' knowledge. You should be smarter when you leave here about uh, Adams and Jefferson. It should nurture some skills, you some critical thinking, and critical reading skills, and corroboration, and those kinds of skills. And it should also foster some disposition. Maybe that you have an old friend, former friend that you haven't talked to for a while, and you might feel motivated to reach out to them and build a little bit of social capital <laughs> after this. Okay, so this is what we're going to start with, or this is the agenda. We'll start with a little game. Are you more like Jefferson or Adams? And then we'll talk about knowledge, skills, and dispositions. And then we'll do this Jefferson Adams case study, or an abbreviated version. And then we'll do a debriefing and talk about what happened here. So, for this little activity, are you more like Jefferson or Adams? I've got 23 or 24 little questions, and I just want you to mark down. You'll, you'll answer them yes or no, and then you need to keep a little tally somewhere to see. And we're going to have a competition here to see who in this group is the most like Jefferson and who in this group is the most like Adams. You ready? So get ready to just do a little tally. Yeah, All right. Is this stuff? Pardon? Is the test in this stuff? Paper? Is what in what? Is the test in these papers? The test? Mm -hmm. No. Not a test. Just here. So, are you more like Adams or Jefferson? Question number one. Do you read novels? <laughs> so you pick yes or no. Just think right now, yes or no. If you said yes, you're more like Adams. So put a little tally by the app. Write down Adams and put a tally. If you say no, you're more like Jeff. He read, not novels. You got it? We all have the same thing. You figure out what we're doing here? Okay. Question number two. Do you write regularly in a diary or journal? If you said yes, you're more like Adams. If you said no, you're more like Jefferson. He kept records, but it wasn't really a diary or a journal. He kept crazy records about the weather and everything else, but not really diary type of stuff. All right, question three. Do you buy books without any self-restraint? <laughs> At the end of the presentation, I'll post two slides that have the two latest books I've written. From <laughs> okay, if you said yes, you're more like Jefferson. If you say no, you're more like Adams. Do you care a great deal about dressing stylishly? <laughs> you're a teacher. <laughs> you're, <laughs> no, I'm kidding. I'm a teacher. All right, if you said yes, you're more like Adams. No, more like Jefferson. Do you play a musical instrument and encourage family members to play music? Think yes or no? Yes, you're more like Jefferson. No, more like Adams. All right. Are you an art lover? Yes, you're Jefferson. No, more like Adams. Do you frequent, frequently get down on yourself for flaws or mistakes? Yes, you're more like Adams. If you can just let it run off your back, more like Jefferson. Were you awkward around people of the opposite sex when you were young? <laughs> Trick question. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Do you, do you find it irresistible to make snarky comments? You're seventh graders. I mean, when they just set themselves up for something snarky, you just let them have it. Yes, you're more like Adams. No, you're more like Jefferson. Would others describe you as mild mannered? Yes, you're Jefferson. No, Adams. Do you hold lawyers in high esteem? I was going to put Scotch pictures in the middle of this. You know. This is an interesting question because they're both lawyers, right? Yes, Adams appreciated lawyers. Jefferson never did like him very much. All right. Would you prefer a trip to Paris over a trip to London? 
Yes, you're Jefferson. No, you're Adams. How about this? Would you prefer an intellectually equal marriage over a patriarchal marriage? <laughs> yes, Adams. No, Jefferson. And if there's a woman in the room who said no on that one, she's in there. <laughs> All right. Nobody's looking at your answer. You answer honestly. Cindy can't see what you're writing. Are you, speaking of which, are you opinionated? <laughs> <laughs> yes, Adams. No, Jefferson. Do you tinker around with things to try to make them work better? Okay, yes, it's Jefferson. He's a little inventor. No, it's Adams. Would others consider you an optimist? You optimistic? Yes, is Jefferson. No, is Adams. I think we're about done. Are you jovial with close friends? Yes, Adams. No, is Jefferson. Do you have trouble balancing a budget? Again, nobody's looking at your answers. <laughs> yes, it's Jefferson, as you well know. Do you have expensive tastes? This question kind of goes with the last one. Yes, it's Jefferson. Do you respect organized religion? Yes, it's Adams. Do you tell it like it is, regardless of whether you might hurt someone's feelings? Yes, it's Adams. Do you believe there's something truly exceptional about America and Americans? And Jefferson had more of that opinion. Are you a gifted writer? Well, if you said yes, you're more like Jefferson. Do you like to tell jokes? This is more of Adams. Do you worry that too much democracy might lead to mob rule and anarchy? This is Adam's view, so that would be, yes, you're more like Adam's. All right, I think that was the last one. Yeah. Okay, so now we've got to figure out, count them up, how many for Jefferson, how many for Adam's. And let's just, let's just start it this way. If you had more than, we're right after lunch, so if you had, I need to make you move around a little. If you had more than five for Adam's, please stand up. More than five on Adam. Okay, if you had more than six, stay up. Otherwise, sit down. More than seven? More than eight? More than nine? More than ten? Eleven? Twelve? Thirteen? More than fourteen? More than fifteen? More than sixteen? All right. More than 17. Okay, here we go. More than 18. Okay, we got a tie. Way to go. Okay. So you two, I think probably what we'll do is have the winner for Jefferson, the winner for Adams, come down and have an arm wrestle. <laughs> no, not really. All right, good. How about for Jefferson? Stand back up if you had more than five on Jefferson. <coughs> Okay, more than six, more than seven, more than eight, nine, more than 10, more than 11, more than 12, more than 13, more than 14, more than 15. 
Okay, we're getting right to the nitty gritty now. More than 16. All right. Okay, way to go. You are, of this large group, you are the most like Jefferson. So way to go. All right. <laughs> That's great. All right. Well, as you can see from that, these two men are very different. They come from very different backgrounds. They are just very different people. And yet they became great friends, and then they became great enemies, and then they became great friends again. And that's kind of what we'll talk about in the case study. Um, let's talk about knowledge, skills, and dispositions for a minute. And so, we need to... <laughs> I knew that would get a reaction. Informed civic engagement requires knowledge, skills, and dispositions. So we need, and our students need, our adult citizens need knowledge. We need to know things like how to register to vote. And it's also helpful to know a little bit about history and traditions and things like that. And that's, and I think we do a pretty good job of teaching the knowledge. Now, whether or not they retain the knowledge, the studies that we were just hearing about suggest that it may be hard for them to retain a lot of the, the facts that are taught. But I think conceptually, if we teach concepts, those conceptual, that conceptual knowledge, I think, sticks better. For example, I would guess that if you did a survey of Americans and asked, do we have freedom of speech, freedom of press, freedom of religion, right to assemble, freedom of petition, they would say yes on each one of those, even though they can't pinpoint that it's from the First Amendment. And I think it's probably more important they understand that we have those rights and what those rights mean. And those kind, that kind of information, I think, sticks better than the, the, the factual, kind of trivial, it's not really trivia, Bill of Rights, but the factual information, we just don't retain it very well. There's a lot of research that shows it might be in there, but we can't access it if we don't use it a lot. And people don't use that information, like what's in the First Amendment of Bill of Rights. They don't use that information a lot. Um, they might apply it in different ways. but So, so they, they need a lot of, of knowledge, though, in order to be a good citizen and an informed citizen. They need skills. They need to be able to, for example, track down the source and verify the information that they receive through social media. And I don't, I don't know how great of a job we're doing in teaching them skills like sourcing, looking at the source, where is this coming from? And then they need dispositions, such as the energy, the sense of duty, the desire to vote. That engagement is a, is a disposition. And think what a shame it is for those uh, citizens who study the issues, and they have the skills to participate, but they just choose not to for whatever reason. They don't have that disposition. And what's even worse is those people that have the disposition to get involved, but they don't have knowledge and skills. This is how we see something like what happened on January 6th a couple years ago. They, they wanted, those people had a disposition to act and get involved, for sure. They just didn't do it in a way that really accomplished much good and did a lot of harm, in fact. And so these three things, it's vital that we teach all three in all three of these areas if we want people that are really prepared for civic engagement. All right. So with that little background, let's dive into this little case study of Jefferson and Adams. So as we're talking through this, some of the knowledge that I want you to get from this is I want you to understand a little bit about the election of 1800. It is, you know, I, I, I did quite a bit of reading to prepare for today's presentation. And the more I read, the more I could see the same kinds of issues being talked about in 1800 that were talked about in our last presidential election. They had a special election commission to try to figure things out. They had to, I mean, it was, a, it was controversial. And um, I think there's some lessons that we can apply as we're trying to figure things out now if we know a little bit about things that have happened in the past. And this election of 1800 is a really good election to know about. 
I want you to walk away from here with certain skills. I want you to have the ability to use evidence to justify a claim. So at the end of this activity, I would have students make certain claims about uh, certain principles of interpersonal relationships. And, I, and for each of those claims, I'm going to ask them to cite the evidence that they're using to support that claim. So this is a skill. It's important for citizens to be able to understand, first of all, that claims need to be based on evidence, and then knowing how to cite evidence to support a claim. And then the other, the disposition that I want you to get from this activity is the tendency to live peaceably, even with those people who we disagree with and we're really different from, like Adams and Jefferson were. Okay. So, and for you, I also want you to get a feel for what a document-based lesson is like. So I'm going to give you an example of a document-based lesson. But in, in each document-based lesson, I think that there's four or five really important parts. Number one, I think it's important that students have a little bit of background information going into the <coughs> lesson. Because uh, the documents that you provide to them, in order for them to really comprehend those documents, they need to have some background information they can make connections to. They may need to know a little bit of vocabulary. They might need to know who some people were. Um, when you do a document-based lesson, a lot of times it's like getting into the trees and you're grappling around in the trees. But the background information that you do before kind of shows them the forest. And this is how this little case study that we do fits in with what's going on in the world. So I think it's important to give students a little bit of background information before you dive into a document-based lesson. And then you give students some kind of a question. This is our focus question for this inquiry. We are, by the time we're through, we want to be able to answer this question. And good questions are open-ended, and they, are, uh, they allow space for different students in the class to come up with different interpretations that are then discussed based on the evidence that's provided. Good document-based lessons have evidence. And so you'll see in the materials that I gave you I have uh, uh, an essay that I wrote that gives background information that I think is pertinent to the documents that you'll be looking at. I have a question that we'll focus on, and then I gave you a packet of evidence. This evidence includes, I think, 19 letters, and I read hundreds of letters between Adams and Jefferson and others and pulled what I thought were uh, letters that kind of laid out an interesting inquiry where students might be able to come up with different ideas about their friendship. So you have that evidence packet. And then you also, uh, I think when we're doing document-based lessons with students, we need to give them support so they can work with them. And that includes, so I like a graphic organizer or some way for them to keep a record of the evidence as they're sorting through it. I don't recommend going back up here to evidence. I don't recommend necessarily giving 19 documents or 17 documents, whatever's in there, to your students to work with. We'll talk in a few minutes about some different ways that you might use 19 documents, but um, let's say you even just give them five of the documents. By the time students have looked at five documents, they can't remember where they heard what, and so some kind of a graphic organizer that allows them to keep their, the evidence straight and where it's coming from and when it was produced uh, can be really helpful and effective. Other support that you can give is you can model for students or you can teach them explicitly about how to analyze a document or how to consider the source of a document and why perspective matters when you're uh, reading a primary source. And then with students, I like to do a debriefing. So once they've had a chance to analyze evidence, usually in small groups, I've given them some support, and they come up with their conclusion. Then we get back together as a class, and we say, okay, what did you come up with? What did you come up with? Well, how come you came up with different things? How did you, what, what evidence supports your opinion? Or your, I, I don't use opinion usually. I talk about interpretation. Because interpretation is evidence-based. An opinion can just be kind of pulled out of thin air. So what evidence did you use to reach that interpretation? And then I can turn to somebody else to reach a different interpretation. I can say, well, how do you respond to that evidence that convinced them? And give them a chance to talk about that evidence and maybe give some kind of a rebuttal on it. 
So that all happens during a debriefing in class. So, and by evidence, the world is full of great historical evidence. You just, uh, you just need to search a little bit. Okay, so let's get into this. In, the, the, in your packet, there's this background information, and I'm going to just kind of highlight some of the key parts from this. Um, uh, you know, these two men are really important in our nation's early history. I think it's worth studying their lives and especially studying their interaction and their correspondence. Jefferson, as you know, came from, and, and I'm given an abbreviated version of what I would give the students because I know most of you are history teachers and so you know this story, uh, many of you better than I do. But Jefferson, he is part of the Virginian aristocracy, grew up in plantation life, uh, was a plantation owner, enslaved individuals on his plantation, and he was surrounded by this culture of slavery. Um, he Adams, in contrast, grew up in Massachusetts, in, uh, and I've been there to his home, with some of you, I think, um, Braintree. He, he was a kind of middle class, and whereas Jefferson kind of had his finances kind of laid out for him from the start, and didn't, he didn't ever really worry about finances, which came back to bite him. But Adams had to be more worried about finances. He was a middle class. He had to scrape things together. He went to law school for a career. Jefferson didn't have to worry as much about a career as Adams did. So they come from those completely different backgrounds. Massachusetts is one of the most equal societies in the world at that time, and Virginia obviously was not. Um, they became friends when they met at uh, the Second Continental Congress. They worked together on the Declaration of Independence. Adams was first asked if he'd write it, and he didn't think much was ever going to come of this document, and so he turned. He was kind of a glory monger a little bit, and he thought, nah, it's kind of beneath me. And so he recommended that Jefferson be write it. And so Jefferson was assigned to write the Declaration of Independence, you know, this document that everyone never really amount to much. Uh, but then Adams became a consultant in the project, and they became friends at that point. Um, and then, during much of the Revolutionary Era, they were both sent to Europe to work together on, in diplomatic, and in the aftermath of the Revolution, I should say, they were in Europe together. And while they were there, they spent a lot of time together in France. Their families came and their families associated with each other, and they became really good friends in France. And then Adams moved to Great Britain for diplomatic reasons, and then eventually came back uh, home to the States, and Jefferson followed a little while later. But it was really while they were in Europe that they became very close to each other. Uh, Abigail Adams became a very good friend of Thomas Jefferson's, and Abigail took care of uh, Jefferson's kids. Jefferson's wife had passed away before he went, and Abigail helped with the kids while, while he was there. And then the spark that kind of started the conflict between them was the French Revolution. And Jefferson thought it was great what was happening, and Adams thought it was horrific. And both of them wrote about their opinions, and then they wrote responding to each other's opinions. And people, you, you know, it's hard to believe people would try to take advantage of this conflict. But when they start, when people started to notice this clash between these two great men, they started to publish things, and pretty soon, this kind of personal disagreement was made public, and there were some feelings hurt between Adams and Jefferson. And then about the same time, they're both involved in government, and then they really start to butt heads over some political issues. And uh, Jefferson resigned from Washington's cabinet, started the Democratic-Republican Party, and at that point, there really is a lot of, of uh, conflict between them. The election of 1796, elections then, especially 1796 elections, it's not like elections now, it's really short, People didn't know Washington wasn't going to serve a third term until just a few months before the new the 
new election was going to take place. And so it was very short. It was really, there wasn't a lot of, of campaigning. Uh, and Adams won that election in 1796. And Jefferson came in second. And so he, was, he became vice president under the way things operated then. And he served as vice president for Adams, but had a few assignments. Um, in fact, one of the first, Adams didn't know what to do with him, so right away he said, hey, I've got a special assignment for you. I want you to go to France as a diplomat. And Jefferson said, I'm not going back. But I think Adams was trying to get rid of him, you know, because he just didn't know what to do with him as vice president. But um, Jefferson claimed at the end of that election that he was happy with the outcome. He said, I'm glad he won. I never doubted it, he said. Well, 1800, that election was very different. So uh, it was pretty clear that this was going to be, there was going to be more campaigning. There were more states were starting to use a popular vote to determine uh, what the electors, how the electors would vote. And so the, the election of 1800 was really nasty. Uh, representatives for Jefferson published the most vicious attacks on Adams. And Jefferson was also attacked by Adams' campaign, or just representatives. The, the, those two, at the time, the candidates kind of stayed above the fray, and they weren't really involved in the negative uh, interactions, but their, their agents were vicious with each other. And as you know, uh, Adams lost, Jefferson won, and that campaign went to the, the election of 1800 ended up going to the House of Representatives to decide. I don't know if you remember this from history, but Aaron Burr and Jefferson both received the same number of votes. And so the House of Representatives had to make a decision on it, and people are choosing sides. It's just so messy. This is where, well, the, the feud had been brewing a little bit before, but uh, the Burr-Hamilton feud really started to grow after the election of 1800, and it continued to grow for a few more years, and finally, you know, Burr shot and killed Hamilton in a duel. So that's the kind of anger and the kind of viciousness that's ha taking place in this election of 1800. Dr. Notes? Yes? Do you show that there's a really short, it's only like two minutes long, YouTube clip where they take quotes from the election of 1800? No, that would be great. It's, it's it's really good, and it's the agents of Adams and Jefferson. Yeah. And so, just two minutes long, just search in election of 1800. On YouTube. On YouTube. Really, okay. really good, and it, like, compares, like, Adams said, or Adams' agents say, if, if Jefferson's elected, all of your children will be killed on a pike. <laughs> and that was then, one of the main platforms of the Democratic yes, Party. Yes. <laughs> and then uh, Jefferson's agent said that if Adams is picked, uh, all of your children, or all of your daughters will, their chastity will be violated. It's pretty, it's pretty rough, but hilarious. Yeah. No, that's great. Yeah, that sounds like that would supplement this document. Pretty well, well, just the election of 1800. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Single part. So I think, I think there's a couple things from in the documents that you've got. There, there are a couple of documents from each of these stages of the, the lives of these two men as they're writing each other. And Abigail is, it has some letters and stuff in there. So Jefferson won. And after, uh, and after the election was over, Adams was humiliated by the loss. He's a one-termer, you know, the first one-termer. And he didn't even stick around to congratulate Jefferson. These are old friends. I mean, they were good friends and close friends in, when they were in France. And Adams didn't stick around to congratulate Jefferson. He snuck away. Jefferson sought him out in 1801, and they had a conversation. And it started out pretty tense. And then gradually, by the time they were through, they softened up and were kind of reminiscing a little bit. But it wasn't enough to mend the damage that had been done, and they pretty much closed off communication. The letters that they wrote uh, when Jefferson took over as president, it kind of reminds me like a couple that goes through a divorce, and they're trying to figure out what time you're picking up the kids. Or, you know, those, I mean, they're very just business letters. I'll leave the horses for you, you know, and that kind of stuff. And that's the kind of interaction that they had. And even that was pretty limited. And then once Jefferson took over in office, then communication really stopped completely between them. Um, 
The one exception to that, and this is this is my of the letters that you have, the materials that you have. I don't know if I tell you this right now because you'll turn to it and you won't listen to me. <laughs> I know how you're like your students. <laughs> a document 14 is a really sweet letter that Abigail wrote to Thomas Jefferson when she heard that his daughter had passed away. And she, her son had just recently passed away. And so she could kind of feel that parent's pain. And she wrote this sweet letter. I, when I pulled it up and was reading through it, I just wept in my office. I'm not going to read it to you now because I don't want to cry in front of you. But it's a sweet, sweet note. And it ends with, it's, it's kind of, it's kind of, it, it, it's touching in a lot of ways. But she ends it as someone who used to consider herself your friend or something along those lines. But basically, it's like saying, we used to be friends, which also is heartbreaking a little bit. And he, he wrote back, and she wrote, and he wrote back and forth a few times. And then Adams, John Adams, found out that they'd been writing to each other. He didn't know, and he put a stop to it. Or at least, that's, there's a document in your packet that kind of suggests that he put an end to their conversations. Um, so that was, there wasn't much communication with, between them for a while. And then in 1811, they had a mutual friend named Benjamin Rush. And Dr. Rush, he, he loved both of these men, and he just thought it was an American tragedy that they, the writers of the, of the Declaration of Independence were not friends. And so he took it upon himself. He was going to try to make these two come to back to their old friendship. And so he wrote to Adams and said, hey, I'll bet if you wrote to Jefferson, he would write you back. And Adams wrote back and said, yeah, I, I'm kind of busy. And he wrote to Jefferson and said the same thing. And Jefferson said, well, I, I would, but I'm nervous about how he would respond. And so Rush is trying to push this a little bit. And then there was a delegation that was sent out, I think from President Monroe, to just travel the country and and interact with people. They met with, and this delegation, two of the delegates were Jefferson's neighbors, the Cole brothers, and they met with Adams, and while they were talking to Adams, Adams said, you know, I love Jefferson. I've always loved him, and I still love him. And so these Cole brothers went back and reported that to Jefferson, and then Jefferson wrote back to Rush again and said, this is like middle school kids, you know? <laughs> 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 Jefferson wrote to Rush and said, the timing is right, might be right right now. Why don't you reach out again to Adams and see if they're right? So Rush wrote to Adams again. Adams wrote to Jefferson and said, it was just a short note, and said, I've got some cloth from Massachusetts I'm going to send you just to show how cloth is being manufactured now in this state. And it was nice, nice to think about you and our friendship. You know, just a little note like that. And Jefferson got that and immediately wrote back. And then for the rest of their lives, they wrote letters back and forth to each other and talked about religious views and philosophies and government ideas. And every once in a while, they would bring up some of the old issues that they disagreed on. But that, was, but that wasn't what most of their communication was about. Benjamin Rush, so he claimed... And if you're a believing kind of person, then, I mean, this is a little bit controversial. He claimed that he saw a dream. He had a dream. And in his dream, he opened up a book. And in the book, it said, in 1811, John Adams and Thomas Jefferson renewed their friendship, started to write letters to each other, or started, I mean, I'm using 21st century language, but court began, began their correspondence with each other and continued that correspondence until they both died at almost the same time. That's what it said in the book. And so uh, Rush, after he, he wrote to Adams and he told him about this dream, and Adams said, that's not history. Like, you didn't read that in a history book. Might be prophecy, though, and kind of left it at that. And then, and... Adams was just kind of skeptical about this whole thing. He'd write, Rush would write to him, and he'd write back and say, I know what you're doing. You're writing to Jefferson, too, trying to get him to write to me. And so, you know, he was kind of on to him. Anyway, 
Oh, you know what? I've got slides that kind of talk about this stuff that I just forgot about. I get so excited. There's Adam's background. There's Jefferson's. The, well, that's not his background. That's Monticello that he built. But it's similar to his background. That's them French and Indian War, political parties. Abigail's letter. That's Benjamin Rush. So he's really the one that's reconnecting them. When they, do you know who this is? This is Daniel Webster. So what does he have to do with the story? <laughs> when, they, when they passed away, do you know Adams and Jefferson passed away on the 4th of July, on the 50th anniversary of the 4th of July, within a few hours of each other. And Daniel Webster gave a great eulogy in Faneuil Hall, Faneuil Hall in Boston about these two and talked about just what a treasure their correspondence was and what national treasures they were. But America really paid attention when these two passed away on the 4th of July, 1826. Um, and their letters, the letters of their final years of their life, really a national treasure today. So, okay, so that's this, and this is an example of the kinds of letters they were writing to each other. This, in fact, this is the last letter that was sent from Jefferson to Adams in March of 1826, just a couple months before they passed away. All right. So this is this is the question that I would work on with students now. So they've got a little bit of background. They understand that these two men are very different, and they got really different ideas about government, but they also have this friendship together. What principles can be found in the letters that were written between Adams and Jefferson and their friends? that might serve as a model for nurturing relationships across political divides. So what? let's look at their letters, let's look at the way they communicated with each other, and let's see if we can find some principles that can teach us about how we can get along with others that we disagree with. So you've got in the packet of materials, this is a graphic novel or a graphic organizer that I would use with students. And so the instructions say, Thomas Jefferson and John Adams developed, lost, and resumed their friendship through their lifetimes. Their efforts and the efforts of others to promote their friendship in spite of their political differences can serve as an example of relationship building that might be useful during the polarization of 21st century politics. Use this graphic organizer to collect evidence to answer the following question. What principles can be identified in the correspondence between Adams and Jefferson and others that might serve as a model for nurturing relationships across political divides. In the first column, make a claim about the principles. In the second column, list the documents that support your claims. And claims that are supported by evidence from more than one document are easier to defend. So if you can find two or three documents that point to the same principle, then that makes it even stronger. And then the third column, in the third column, summarize the evidence that led to your claims. See the example in the first row of the graphic organizer. So I've done the first row for them so they can see what I'm talking about, how to fill this out, and how to look for evidence, make a claim, and, and that connection between claims and evidence. Then answer the questions that appear below the graphic organizer. All right. So let's take a look at a couple of these documents together. And I like to model with students a little bit about just the process of my analysis. So I look at this. This is this is a letter from Abigail Adams to Mary Cranch, who is her sister, on May 8, 1785. This is while they're in France. So it says, part the for source information. When I prepare documents, I'm going to give enough source information that kids understand a little bit the context, who's speaking, their perspective. Those kinds of things. So sometimes, as you can see here, my source information is almost as long as the excerpt from the document. So I've got part of a letter written by Abigail Adams to her sister, Mary Cranch. And so when I think about Abigail Adams, that's John Adams' wife who was with him in France with Jefferson. So she is an eyewitness. She's there and she knows what's going on. And this is written to her sister. So this is a private correspondence. This isn't like published in the New York Times or whatever. This is a private correspondence between two sisters. And I, that helps me 
think about what I'm going to read in a few minutes. And it was May 8, 1785, so I know this is before the controversies of the French Revolution or these the campaigns of 96 or, or 1800. So this is why they're still pretty happy and friendly with each other. All right. And so it was May 8, 1785, with, while Abigail lived in Paris with her husband John, Jefferson served with Adams as a diplomat in France. And here's another thing. I've changed it for easier reading. Now, the historians in the room are maybe going to throw something at me at this point. But let me take a minute and justify this. Um, I would never give my students a document in German and ask them to pull out evidence to support a claim. They can't read it. I would never give my students a document that's written by attorneys in the 1700s and ask them to pull out evidence and use it to support a claim. They can't read it. They can't read it. It's the end of the activity at that point. It's just a, it's just a venture in futility. I could take a lot of time and teach them how to read it and teach them the vocabulary, but then it becomes a reading lesson instead of a history lesson. And I love to teach history. And so in order to avoid that, I will go through the documents and I will very carefully translate them into language that eighth graders can understand. And that's I had eighth graders, eighth graders in mind as I did this. Now, you might say, all right, I don't need that. You might say uh, it's not a primary source document anymore. That's that, and that maybe is true, but if the kids can't read it. They just can't, we can't proceed with the history lesson. And so I've trans, I've taken out some of the word. The other thing you might say is, it's Abigail Adams. She writes such beautiful language. And she does, and, and I really had a hard time translating her letter. I left it mostly intact, just because her language was so beautiful. But you have to decide. As a teacher, you've got to make decisions about your objectives. And if your objective is to help kids use evidence to support a claim, then get that evidence to them in a simplified form so they can find it and use it and think. You, you only, kids only have so, many, so much working memory. We all have limited working memory. And you can only think about so many things at one time. So we've got a question. What principles guided their, you know, led to their interaction? We've got a question they're thinking about. We've got a document they're reading. We got source information they're keeping in mind. I mean, you're asking kids to do a lot of stuff, and if reading is not really easy for them as they're going through the document, they, they, it overloads them pretty quickly. So, so I've translated this. I've changed it for easier reading. And the other thing I use to justify that is I have the original right here. So if they don't trust what I wrote, they can click on that and they can read what the original said. Or if you have a gifted kid in your class who's just an excellent reader, then have them click on the original and by all means read the original. In the language, I mean, all these letters are written in beautiful language, really. We write it completely different today. Okay, here we go. So, we have as many formal visitors as our money will allow. This is Abigail Adams writing to her sister. So she says, we have as many formal visitors while they're in France. Sorry. We have as many formal visitors as our money will allow. And Mr. Jefferson, with one or two Americans visit us in a socially friendly way. So here, I think, she's really distinguishing between formal visitors and friendly visitors. And Jefferson is coming not in a formal kind of way, but in a social, friendly kind of way. She, she says, I shall really regret leaving Mr. Jefferson. He is one of the choice people of the earth. On Thursday, I dined with him at his house. On Sunday, he is to dine here. On Monday, we all dine with the Marquis. And on Thursday, we dine with the Swedish ambassador. So here, I can see the sincere praise. And I can see these families are spending a lot of time together. And not on business. They're eating meals together in a friendly kind of way. And then, on, in document 10, I can read this letter. And this is written by Thomas Jefferson to Edward Rutledge, who is another one of the founding fathers, on June 24, 1797. And he's describing the partisan debate over foreign affairs. And I remember now, this is, oh, what I do, something like this, I would encourage students, 
Okay, he's writing to Edward Rutledge. Who is Edward Rutledge? Now, this is one of the reasons why maybe some of the trivia in the past isn't as important today. Because if one of my students says, who's Edward Rutledge, what do I say? Get out your phone and Google him. Let's see what we can find about it. And so that quick, we could know Edward Rutledge was founding father, a sign of the Declaration of Independence, and we can find that out about him. And I encourage students, this is something that historians don't even do. They don't, they forget, because they're, I mean, maybe the next generation of historians will do this, but historians, when they're trying to figure out about the source, they very rarely will just Google the source or get their phone out to find out something about the source. But Jeff, that's, that idea of lateral reading, I mean, that's what you're really referring yeah, yeah. to, right? Yeah, yeah. That skill set that Shank, the Santa Fe History Education Group talked about is a really important skill for sourcing information. It is, right, yeah, that's great. So, yeah, so we're gonna, we're gonna encourage it even, that, uh, yeah, go ahead and get out your phone, let's see what we can find out about. We're leaving this document and we're going somewhere else to find out about something that's on this document. That's lateral reading. It's particularly with a website, if you want to know who's behind a website, clicking on the little button that says about us, not good enough. You've got to click on that and get a name and then Google that name. This is what fact, professional fact checkers do and they call it lateral reading. And they can very quickly find out who's really behind this information and not just what they want us to know about it. We can, we can research that. So that's a great skill to teach kids. So you can kind of prime them by telling them, just let's see what we can find out about Edward Rutledge. June 24th, 1797. So this is after the election of 1796. So the political parties are taking shape, and it's a different world now. And this is what he writes. This is from Jefferson. The emotions are currently too high to be cooled in our lifetimes. Pre-pessimistic view of politics. You and I have formerly seen heated debates and strong political emotions, but gentlemen of different politics would then speak to each other and separate the business of the Senate from that of society. It's talking kind of about the good old days, which everybody does, you know, when they get older. Back then, people who disagree with each other, we still interact socially, we go to dinner with each other, we have a drink with each other. Not today. It is not so now. Men who have been friendly all their lives cross the streets to avoid meeting and turn their heads another way so that they are not made to touch their hat, which is a sign of respect. So sometimes I'll translate it and sometimes I'll put in little brackets, something to help kids you know, to hell. If, but if you put too many brackets in, then it gets so confusing that most of it I'll just translate, unless there's like a little phrase that I want to help them understand. So they're not made to touch their hats, I understand. This might work for young men who enjoy emotion, but it is distressing to peaceable minds. Peace is the old man's milk. I'm leaving, I'm leaving in a few days so that I can enjoy it. And to trade the roar and chaos, there's one of my titles, of bulls and bears for the chatter of my grandchildren and forgetful rest. He's ready to be through with politics. And of course, this is 1797. He's still got a ways to go, right? He gets elected president three years later, so he's still got a little more political action to take. Okay. All right, so on the graphic organizer, this is what I gleaned from those two documents. There is this social interaction in non-political settings that strengthens friendships. Jefferson and Adams are dining together. He's referring to people who disagree politically, going out to, and socializing together. So this is maybe one of the things we could look at that would help people who disagree politically. They should socialize together. Can you think of any modern examples of that? The one that comes to mind is, and this is not modern, modern, but within the last decade, is Ruth Bader Ginsburg and Justice Scalia, who would go on vacations and stuff together. And they disagreed completely politically on issues, but they socialized. Okay, so I've got, this comes from both documents, three and 10. In three, it talks about the Adams who dined frequently with Jefferson and they had social visits. And in 10, 
It talks about gentlemen in the past could separate social interactions from politics. So that's one idea. Okay, so we've got, it is 2.05, so we've got 35 minutes. So will you take, let's say, seven minutes now. We'll go until uh, 12 minutes after. And just flip through the document packet that you've got and see if you can find other principles like this idea of social interactions in non-political settings. See if you can find other um, principles that might guide the building of friendships with between people who disagree uh, politically. So, ready, set, go. And talk to the people around you, huh, Jeremy? Real quick, what age group do you design? This is eighth, I tried to target eighth grade, so, no, here's another thing. Take this, use it, and then email me and let me know what I did wrong with it, because I did this theoretically, and you're gonna use it practically. You get what I mean? So I'm thinking eighth grade. You can let me know how close I was to target. 12, 212, we'll regroup and see what you found.
take about another minute and we'll regroup and see what it came up with. Okay, let's hear Jeff. What you, 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 I have a question. Yeah. Um, just your thoughts about um, doing, you know, going through the, the evidence and creating claims as an individual or as small groups. What are your thoughts about that? Yeah, um, depends, on, I think, on your context. But I think small groups can be helpful because you can, especially if you're strategic about the way you group kids. So maybe you have your stronger readers together with maybe some that struggle a little bit. And so they can model a little bit the reading process and help them out that way. So I prefer, when I do the, my lessons, these document-based lessons kind of follow the same format. And I almost always do groups when I, yeah, at this stage of the lesson. Okay, what are some of the, so let me say one other thing now as we get this conversation going again. What is the answer that I'm looking for? Do you know what? I don't know. I this I am giving you space. As students, you are going to become the historians in this activity. You are going to be the ones that piece it together. So I'm not I'm gonna make you justify a claim that you make. What's the evidence that that's based on? But in my mind, I've got to go in with kind of this idea, this open-minded idea that I'm just really curious to see what students come up with. Because if I've got an idea, I got a list of maybe 20 things. I could come up with about these principles, but I want to see what the students have got, and I'm going to give them space to do it as long as they can justify their claims with the evidence. All right, what are some of the ideas? What are the principles that guide these friendships? Yes? Um, I was really struck by in document 16 where um, Jefferson was talking about the fact that um, Adam's opinions are as honestly formed as my own. Um, just this like very optimistic view of other people. They've also gone through a process to come to their own opinions and beliefs that they're not just crazy or just dismissing them out of hand. And like I guess as an anti evidence, looking at the <coughs> Jefferson political cartoon mm -hmm. where he's like literally conversing with the devil essentially, right? Yeah, and, like, the devil there in the corner. Yeah. Um, just the the idea that um, a principle that needs to guide interactions is that people are coming with like the country's best interests at heart, even if the methods that they're using to do that are what we should be debating. Still trusting that they have those best interests. Yes. Okay. Good. So. How would we phrase that principle in, a, in simple terms? I think the statement that you read at first, that's one of my favorite of all the documents, that's one of my favorite lines. His opinions are as honestly formed as my own. So how do we... Assume the best, assume goodwill. Yes, good, all right, good. That's a great, your students aren't gonna come up with that. But that's <laughs> great, I mean, assume goodwill. These are not evil or immoral, or stupid people because they have a different opinion than me. We assume goodwill. I mean, there are immoral people, but we assume goodwill. We assume that. Okay, good. There was another hand up. Uh huh. I just and then, I just like and then I Oh, sorry. Assuming the best of our enemies reminds us that they're like us. Yes. Okay, good. Like assume the best. Assume goodwill. It's a great way to put it. Uh, Ayn. Um, yeah, just kind of along those same lines in that same document. Don't base your opinions on your friends based on what other people are saying. Like, they talk about, oh, the media says we must be enemies. The media says we must disagree, right? Because we disagree on these things. Like, don't let those outside influences say what, what they think you believe get in the way of your actual personal interaction with each other. Okay, great. Yeah, that's a great principle. Mm -hmm. Focus on what you admire about the other person. Um, so, like in document four, um, John, Jeff, John Adams tells me he likes his book, that I know it's on Virginia. Um, Jefferson writing, writing to Adam in the last document, document 19, says, you know, thinking about our past, I hope you go forward and, you know, go forward ahead of me receiving political honors and achievements like you have in the past. Um, so just like focusing on what you admire about the other person. Yeah, 
great, great. <laughs> I think sometimes we, our, our students think, well, I can't be, we can't talk about politics with our friends, but going back to document four, being able to view things from different people's perspectives and oftentimes taking arguments that are their arguments and making them yours. I have two colleagues that uh, they play golf together once a week and uh, one of them is very much Mormon and the other one is very much not and all they do is they talk religion and on the front nine the Mormon he argues Mormon perspectives and the one argues anti-Mormon but then on whole 10 they switch sides and so the Mormon <laughs> argues as an anti-Mormon and the anti-Mormon argues as a Mormon and they have they keep their conversations going so sometimes the things that are most uh, argumentative can bring you together, but if you can view each other in each other's perspectives. Yeah, and a lot of that is about assuming goodwill yep. from the start. Yeah. Okay, there were a few other hands up. So. Yes. Uh -huh. Yeah. yeah. Um, I just, I'm taking it to a good level, it's like, like workmanship. Like, good job, I'm so glad you won. Yeah. And I think that's something that students can get on the level with and understand their reason. Yeah, good. Do you, did you notice the one letter was not sent? So Jefferson wrote it, got ready to mail it, and one of his advisors looked at it and said, you can't send that. It'll be too, it'll build them up too much. And stupidest advice that he was ever given, probably, you know. What yeah. was that? Uh, it was the one right after Adams won the election, where Jefferson Number says, nine. what is it? Nine. 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 Jefferson says in the document, I'm glad, I, I'm happy you won. I knew that's what was going to happen, and I'm happy it turned out that way. And I don't, I, I mean, that's probably not true. That's not true. But anyway, he wrote it. Yeah. I think, I think a great thing that I would hope that my students would pick out of it is um, to stay civil even when things are hard. And don't say things you're going to regret. Like, they, they stayed civil through all of these letters. Um, even when things were the most tense. Your most humble and obedient servant uh, is how they signed off. Mm -hmm. And those are some pretty big disagreements. Mm -hmm. You don't have yeah, so there's, there's a style kind of thing in this, that your communication can be civil, even when you're, you disagree, and their communication is obnoxiously civil. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, and even in document 13, when it's John Adams writing and talking about how he's leaving the horses and it's very business-like, it's so considerate. Right, because he's talking about how, oh, well, I'm, I'm going to save you the trouble and expense of having to do this. Like, he still has his friend's interests at heart, even after this, like, Horrible event. He's yeah. still not being like petty because he could have just been like, "What us figure it out." <laughs> could have taken. I heard when George W. Bush was elected, they took all the as Clinton was leaving, they took all the W's off the typewriters in the <laughs> White House. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if that's true. Not it's not. a great story, anyway. <laughs> okay, there's a couple of other. Uh huh. Um, I really like documents seven and eight back to back, where um, Jefferson had said. We have different as friends should do respecting the purity of each other's motives. So assuming good intent. But then I really loved and I thought, oh, we still need this now, where it says, um, keeping our difference of opinion to private conversation instead of airing things publicly on social media. And then when Adams replies, he's like, oh, okay, I didn't know that this was the way you felt. We actually haven't talked about this. This is the way I feel. But then he goes on and he says, I would rather resign than have a friend like you forsake me. And so, yes, we've had these problems, but I'm not going to hold a grudge. And I think that's the second thing. Is, uh -huh. So don't air it publicly and don't hold grudges. Yeah. I thought that was an interesting statement. We've never really talked much about government. I mean, they wrote the Declaration of <laughs> <laughs> you know, All right. All right. That's great. Great, great, great. I hope, I hope when you use this with your classes that you can draw some of these things out for the kids. I don't know. It'll be interesting when I start hearing feedback on what happens? Let me point out a couple of things. Oh, go ahead, Cindy. I actually just had a question. You know, they were really nice in their letters, but Jefferson in real life was telling the people, like he was the guy that was quietly manipulating social he, media. He hired people to... Yeah, so it's somewhat dishonest. It's like the campaign going on right now where they're really nice in their own ads for Senate, but they have these other groups sponsoring ads that are really nasty about the other person. So I wonder how much of this lesson is authentic because Jefferson was being unauthentic mm -hmm. in, you know, I love you and I'm so sorry we feel this way, yeah. and then being negative practice. 
Yeah, so this is more about their in their communication rather than maybe in their actions. And yeah. you would have to bring in other evidence to really get at their actions that may or may not have been as, you know, these principles, there might be different principles that you find in that, or a lack of principles in some cases. Yeah, you're right, this is, this is simplified for sure, because it's like, it's a complex story, but yeah. So to clarify my question, so when you do groups, when you do small groups, you're saying small group one, you do document eight, small group two, you do document nine, or you say go after all of them? Okay, that brings us right to what I want to talk about next. Let me give you this comment, and then we'll move into that. You know, one of the things that occurs to me is this may be a good time or a, a good time or a good example to explain the differences between communication then and now. Then communication were involved some effort and some thought, some pondering, because of the instruments they used, pen, you know, the quill or ink, and that sort of thing. And there was time to consider. But now you can just express an emotion of the moment and not consider the consequences. So I I think that is an important point to bring out. Yeah, I, I know these men and women were brilliant that we're reading their letters from, but I don't think you can write a letter like this in one draft, immediately <laughs> writing it out. You've got to think carefully about your words to use the kind of imagery and the phraseology that they're using in, in these. So they definitely are well thought out. And usually, so the, the letters are not just letters written to that person, but they're also a record. And a lot of times they would write the letter and then they would write a second copy that they would keep in a letter book. And did you see that when John Adams read, did you, did you see the one little quote in there? John Adams found the letter, the copies of the letters that Abigail had been writing to Jefferson. He kind of flipped out a little bit and just said, no comment. I found all these letters that she'd been writing to Jefferson. I have nothing else to say about it right now. Okay, now to Jeff's question. How do we use this evidence? So you've got one letter from the Revolutionary Era and five from Europe and four letters from kind of this divisive period and then two documents related to this election and then from Jefferson's presidency and then four at the end of their lives to kind of show the revival of their friendship. That's a lot of evidence to use with kids. And you can't take do this lesson for three days with kids. So let me... Uh, oh, and a couple other things. So this evidence, it doesn't look like this because kids would really struggle with this. I've transcribed it or written them up in, it's transcribed so they can read it easily. They don't have to decipher cursive. Not that there's anything wrong with making your kids read cursive, a, an original document like this sometimes, or giving it to them so they can see the original along with the transcription. But again, it's this working memory issue. If they've got to read this, they're gonna get bogged down in the reading and they may not even comprehend what the letter's saying and they can't move into the next part of the lesson. So I've transcribed them. I've mostly just excerpted, excerpt, cut the little sections out <laughs> that I wanted kids to read rather than give them a big long thing that they've got to search. You know, they, a lot of these letters have a lot of business kinds of stuff in them. And so I cut all that out, and it's, I get to the heart of the matter. Now, this is not authentic to what historians do. I, you know, I'm doing a lot of work for them, but for the activity's sake, I think it's okay. They're mostly excerpted. And then I translate it into eighth grade vocabulary. It's really probably 10th grade, but it usually takes me two or three or four passes through, simplifying it each time before I finally get there. But it's a lot closer than how it was originally. And they're provided in chronological order in the packet. So now, here are uh, five different ways you might use these. So one is I sometimes will give students an archive of these documents. And that's just giving them all and saying, I want you to sort through these. Well, just like I did with you. So you, this is a little mini archive of documents. And you just go through at your own pace. We're going to work on this for 15 minutes. Get through as many of them as you can. And you let them kind of go through. You can, depending on the activity, you can help them be a little bit strategic. So you can say, you need to, while you're looking at these, you need to look at at least one from Jefferson's perspective and at least one from Adam's perspective, or something like that. So you can help them be strategic, but otherwise, you just give them the documents, say you got 15 minutes, look through as many as you can. 
Another, and on Canvas, it's really easy to do that too. You can, you know, set up a, them digitally for them to just pick and choose. Or you can divide and conquer. So this is where you pass these out, one to each student in the class, a couple kids get two, or you can find, you can really easily find other letters. Uh, and so you can give one to each kid in the class and then you can have them analyze it, get up and just explain briefly, this is what it shows about their relationship. Or you could look through the packet and you could pick four or five that you think get at the heart of what you want to have students thinking about in your lesson. And then you just curate from all of these for your students. Or you can pull out one or two and analyze them with the class, either before getting them in small groups to work on them or just do that as the activity. I like it better when the kids are exploring. Excuse me. You could do a gallery walk which is about like the first one, but a little bit different, where you blow them up a little bigger, you post them around the wall of your room, and then the kids go and look, and they maybe have a, a notepad that they're taking notes on, and they go and look at another, and it allows them to move around a little bit. So to answer your question, Jeff, you just decide on your objectives and what, how much time you have, and, and just go from there. So I put 19, or however many there are in there, knowing it's probably more than what most teachers will use for most lessons. I would also argue that this could be a good way to scaffold it. So you can start by modeling it, then go, you know, with small groups, and then just it could be scaffolded as well. So when you start it out, I would, you know, it might be better to, you know, do you model it, do classroom as a class, and then as they get more well versed with this stuff, then you can move on to smaller work, gallery walk, and then individual at the end. So you can scaffold it as well. I wouldn't. I wouldn't start by, you know, doing it individually. Just turning them loose. Yeah, there you go. You know, so <laughs> yeah. you know, you could put it in a scaffolding. Sure, order. it's good. You, I mean, you could, as you set this up, you could say, oh, you know what, this one would be good on the on the exam that I'm going to give. Pull that one out and have you know one on there and have students talk about the context of that document or something like that. So yeah. you can use these, you know, in lots of different ways. Okay, these are the questions that I have listed on the bottom of the graphic organizer. So after students have gone through and tried to pull out some principles and then cited the evidence, then I'm asking which principles that you've listed above were supported by evidence found in more than three documents? So what are the, the principles that you can argue the strongest for? How might these principles, and I don't mean just these for number one, how might these principles be applied today to help individuals establish friendships with people who differ from them? And then to drive it home, in your own interaction with people, how can you apply these principles? Because eventually I wanted to get, I wanted them to develop these dispositions themselves so that they're more willing when they hear somebody that they disagree with to listen and give them the, Assume goodwill is the way you word it, which is great. Okay. Um, let's debrief for a minute. We've got about 10 minutes. So what, when I do a debrief, so this is the way I think through the lesson, I think, were my objectives, what I wanted to accomplish with the lesson, were those worthy objectives, and were they accomplished with this lesson? So, and, and then well, I'll give all the questions, and I'll just open it up, and we'll just talk about it. The background information. Did I leave information out that would have been vital for kids to look at the documents? Uh, and so part of the purpose of the background information is to help kids be ready with, with the, to work with the documents. And so I might go back through the background information and revise it and put in, make sure Benjamin Rush is included in the background information so that when they see his name, they'll know, oh yeah, I remember we learned a little bit about who he was, you know, and the others that are mentioned. Um, was the question adequate, appropriate? Did it help move students towards the objectives? Was the evidence good? Did the evidence lead students to answer the question? Did I have balanced evidence? Did I have conflicting evidence? Or did all the evidence point to the same conclusions? Was the graphic organizer organized well? Did it provide enough support? What other support? <coughs> what I need to give students. And so each time I do a document-based lesson, I go through these same questions after and say, okay, how can I make this a little bit better? And the fact that I'm giving you these materials without having taught them at all 
it makes me a little nervous because I haven't gone through this process at all after working with kids with them. So it's up to you to kind of go through these questions. But let's, you, you're in the classroom, so you can anticipate some of these issues, I think. So what would you say, uh, just to debrief on this, on these materials really quickly? Yeah. Uh -huh. Yes. I would say, just thinking of like my students, my eighth graders, um, helping them know what to look for as far as claims go. Because, you know, like, well, what do you want me to find, Mr. Winterton? You know, mm -hmm. like, what claims do you want me to look for? What would be something that I could uh, come up with or use as a claim? You know, like, yeah. that would, I almost think maybe if this was the first time I was doing it, like, present, like, give three or four claims, and then you guys find the documents, you guys find the evidence that supports that claim. Mm -hmm. That's great. Yeah, that's a great scaffolding device. Sometimes I'll say, and sometimes I'll, I'll throw out, here's five potential interpretations. Some of you have seen the book that I wrote, uh, Teaching History and Learning Citizenship. And in that, one of, the, one of the studies, it's the same principle. How did Gorbachev and Reagan, how were they able to get along with each other and try to mend some of these issues of the Cold War? And I give the students six interpretations. And I say, go through this, these documents and see if you can find any evidence to support these interpretations. So it's a great idea, a great, that raises the level of scaffolding to where the kids might need it. Uh, Jared. Along those same lines, uh, I was wondering, because like, I don't know, I, I teach this in some grade, so this is a little below the age that you're, your target age here. But I think this could work really well in one of my classes. So, but the... Uh, my question is basically like along the claims. I don't know if they're going to be able to like pull that out, come out with it. But do you think I'm looking at another lesson that you've done um, that we use in our in my class? The twelve guidelines for working with someone you disagree with. Did we find these twelve guidelines in these letters? Was some that, some of them I think you find. Yeah. Could you marry those two together and? Like, okay, find the evidence that supports that. Claim. Yeah, I think that's like, kind of... Yeah, that. I think that kind of goes yeah. with, uh, along the line of the same, yeah, that comment from the book. So, good. Other ideas, concerns, issues? Uh-huh, Rob? I, just, I mean, for me, it'd be like, also trying to think about how do we connect this again to today, you know? And I was just speaking with the legislator two days ago, who said that he and his opponent, they met and they laid out ground rules for their campaign before this first uh, house, uh, state house you left. And he said it's been a, really kind of a case study of civility in terms of what, what a campaign should look like. And I think it could be a really cool connection to how do we see this replicating today. Yeah, that's no, I love that. I think, so, we want students to develop these dispositions and to understand some concepts about, uh, well, just this concept of seeing other people as, seeing the goodwill, or assuming goodwill in other people. So, in order for that to happen and really stick with students, they need to be exposed to these concepts in multiple settings and multiple contexts, and so, if you can find six lessons in history that show, you know what, people that disagree with each other can really get along anyway. Look at Gorbachev and Reagan. Look at Adams and Jefferson. You know, look at all these other examples. And then throw in some modern examples. Look what happened when Governor Cox was running for governor last time. It's a great example of people working together. And so that you show historical examples of this concept, getting along. And then modern examples of the same concept, it's much more likely to stick with students. The research is really solid on that. Mm -hmm. Cindy. I think, well, one, I love the lesson, Jeff. Everything you do is so awesome. I'm thinking, oh, I want to do this. But I think the piece that I would want to put in here is some place where you see Jefferson's, say this carefully, but he's dishonest. He's not authentic. He's showing love here, but then hiring people feeding them with things to say to destroy Adams. So it would be harder for Adams to forget because he knows that. 
right? So I think adding that element of Jefferson owning his authenticity, be honest in your interactions with people, because when you're not, there are consequences. I think that would be a really good element to add to this dialogue, that you can't just have someone else say the mean things and then divorce yourself from that. Mm -hmm. I think that would be a piece yeah. that would be really fascinating. Here. Yeah, it would, yeah. Um, it really adds a level of complexity to the lesson. It's already pretty complex, but yeah, yeah but I think you're right. Mm -hmm. I think another follow up that you could do with it, it just depends on your, your class and how everything goes, but you could have then your kids come up with some rules of how they're going to have discussions when they disagree in class. And so then that way now they're actually now taking this and they're applying it to their current situation. Um, okay, these are the rules that we're going to buy by in this classroom. They come up with it, which means you've got the buy-in, and you're like, hey, you guys agreed to it. You came up with it, and so they're a little bit more committed to that because they came up with that at the class. That's great. And you can use this to help you decide what those rules ought to be. Respectful. Be res and you can disagree, and you can use strong, strong arguments against somebody and still be respectful in the words that you choose to use. And what about teaching controversies and introducing controversies in your classroom? We okay to do that, Robert? State social studies specialist? Yes. Okay. <laughs> All right. Be careful. I don't want to see you in the news. With caution. Yeah, with caution. Yeah, I mean, you approach it with balance and transparency with parents, and you're okay to introduce controversial issues in your classroom. Well, kind of along those lines, when I taught fourth grade, um, we. I, one of the lessons I did was I taught my kids how to respectfully disagree mm -hmm. um, and just kind of that no one wants to listen to you when you come at them with guns blazing. So we actually practiced writing letters and I had some kids write letters to me, I had some kids write letters to the president, I had some kids write letters to the principal um, and just that went through and said, hey, I don't necessarily agree with this policy or this you know, rule mm -hmm. or whatever. Um, and I just felt like a really important, powerful thing that I think could be tied, again, to this kind of like she was saying with the setting rules within your classroom. That's great. Good. All right. We are. We've got about a minute left. Uh, we've gone through the debriefing. Just my email address is here. And so if you want to, I think uh, Carrie is going to make available digital copies of these uh, lessons, materials, and so then you can take them and you can revise them however you want, use them how you want. But if you need something from me, just email me there and I can send you, you know, whatever, and I'm happy to share what I have with you. But thanks for your participation in this, and we got some other great things happening today, so thank you.